Good morning, church. Very intimate group here today. We should all sit in one pew, maybe, in the front. Welcome to all of you who are also watching online this morning or at an, a later time on YouTube or Facebook. We're glad you're here also. Uh, today we are doing uh, something that is the most uh, probably important thing. Uh, that is um, worshiping God. We are designed to worship God. That is our ultimate moral activity, and uh, it is uh, our greatest purpose. So thank you for being here and uh, honoring that and being true to who God created you to be. A couple of announcements before we begin. I uh, just want to tell you that uh, Judy Melander is uh, hospitalized. Uh, hopefully she'll be getting out today. Uh, she was hoping to celebrate uh, her uh, big birthday. I think she's 39 but uh, uh, here at, at church, uh, but she was unable to. So a few of us uh, made our way to the hospital, and we, we sang, and there was cake and uh, a celebration. So I brought all of your love and your, your greetings to her. So if she sees you afterwards and she thanks you for wishing her a happy birthday, uh, go along with it and say, <laughs> and say yes, we did. You know, she is uh, delightfully optimistic, and we're uh, hoping that she will be with us again soon. Uh, our food pantry uh, will be closed this Thursday in celebration for the birthday of our country. Uh, this is uh, obviously the 4th of July this Thursday. So uh, please be safe, and uh, we have much to give thanks to God for uh, with our freedoms that we have here, but we also have much to pray for uh, with uh, many challenges our nation faces. So maybe you can use the 4th of July or a portion of it uh, to pray for our country, our leaders, our upcoming elections, and uh, for the, the people especially that are most vulnerable in our country and uh, who still encounter food insecurity, housing insecurity, and, uh, and great difficulties. Uh, we have our Vacation Bible School kind of last call. Uh, again, registration is closed, but if you uh, have someone call me, I'm sure we can squeeze one or two in. Uh, so please take a look at that and respond if you are able to Pastor Larry's uh, inquiry. Uh, we are trying to figure out which direction to go in uh, for a Bible study in the fall. So he is asking for your input. Uh, those of you who have attended Pastor Larry's Bible study, you know that it's um, more than just an academic exercise. Uh, it's a social time of fellowship and a time for communal growth. So uh, please uh, take a moment and do that. And then finally, our prayer list. Um, we are in the process of updating that. You should take a look. If uh, there are names that uh, you desire to be there and were there and you said what happened to them, uh, you can uh, always put uh, a name on the prayer list. There is no cost. <laughs> and uh, we just ask that you update us uh, periodically uh, about the status of the individuals. When we gather on Wednesday for our prayer group, those who are faithful to that uh, ministry, we pray for each person on the list by name. And I know that there are many congregants that do that as a regular part of their Christian discipline. So please see if you can help us in keeping our prayer list current. So I think that's all that I have by way of announcements this morning. Uh, so at this time, I would say let us do that which we came here to do, and that is Worship the Lord in spirit and truth, and we begin with the confession and words of forgiveness. So please rise. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. O 
holy God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Beloved people of God, Jesus is the manna from heaven and from whom you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there's always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into the abundant life. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, we implore you to hear the prayers of your people. Be our strong defense against all harm and danger, that we may live and grow in faith and hope. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. First reading is Lamentations 3, 22 through 33. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, and great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for one to bear the yoke in youth, to sit alone in silence when the Lord has imposed it, to put one's mouth to the dust, there may yet be hope, to give one's cheek to the smitter and be filled with insults, for the Lord will not reject forever. Although he causes grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love, for he does not willingly afflict or grieve anyone. Word of God, word of life. Thanks. 
Psalmist 30. I will exalt you, O Lord, because you have lifted me up. I will exalt you, O Lord, because you have lifted me up. I will exalt you, O Lord, because you have lifted me up and have not let my enemies triumph over me. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you, and you restored me to health. You brought me up, O Lord, from the dead. You restored my life as I was going down to the grave. Sing praise to the Lord, all you faithful. Give thanks in holy remembrance. I exalt you, O Lord, because you have lifted me up. God's wrath is short. God's favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping spends the night, but joy comes in the morning. While I felt secure, I said, I shall never be disturbed. You, Lord, with your favor, made me as strong as the mountains. Then you hid your face, and I was filled with fear. I cried to you, O Lord. I pleaded with my Lord, saying, what profit is there in my blood if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you or declare your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me. O Lord, be my helper. I will exalt you, O Lord, as you have lifted me up. You have turned my wailing into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. Therefore, my heart sings to you without ceasing. O Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. I will exalt you, O Lord, because you have lifted me up. The second reading is from 2 Corinthians 8, 7 through 15. Now as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, in our love for you, so we want you to also excel in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnest of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this matter I am giving my advice. It is appropriate for you who began last year not only to do something, but even to desire to do something. Now finish doing it, so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your meetings. For it is the eagerness there, the gift that is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of fair balance between your present abundance and the need, and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need, in order that may be fair balance, as it is written. The one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had. And she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, for she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately, her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately, aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you? How can you say, Who touched me? He 
He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leaders of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he entered, he said to them, why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him, and they went in where the child was, and he took her by the hand and said to her, Telathakum, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement, and he strictly ordered them that they that no one should know this, and told them to give her something to eat. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. So a man walks into a butcher store in New York City, he says to the butcher, hey, you a gambling man? Butcher says, yeah, I'm a betting man. He says, okay, I bet you five grand that you can't reach up and touch the meat that's hanging over your head. The butcher pauses, looks up. He says, I can't take that bet. He says, I thought you were a, a betting man, a gambling man. He goes, I am, but the stakes are too high. One of uh, the most scarring memories that I have as a child that uh, I cringe when I even uh, speak about it out loud, I was, uh, I don't even know, how old was I? Three, four? I went to go visit my grandfather Lars, who uh, had a really tough life. My grandfather had fallen off a scaffolding at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, shattered his legs as a master carpenter, lost all of his money completely, lived on top of a bakery. Uh, but before that, after he shattered his legs, he got uh, tuberculosis and was in a sanitarium for about 15 years. Toward the end of his life, he had cancer and dementia. Right before he went to the nursing home, I visited his house little apartment over a bakery. And I remember being in there, and as a little kid, I'm with my dad, and uh, he was very confused, I remember that. But uh, there was very few possessions in this house at this time, they were wiped out. But there was this blue glass thing, it's like a candy dish of sorts. If you're familiar with Scandinavian kind of artwork and things, this blue glass is found in many Norwegian, Danish, and Swedish homes. So it's this blue glass candy dish that was on top of an octagon mirror. And it mesmerized me. And I remember touching it and moving it on the mirror. And my grandfather exploding at me with this giant voice and yelling at me to the point where I was paralyzed and in tears. Don't touch that. Don't touch that. Why am I sharing uh, this memory with you? Well, today is a lot uh, to do with touch. Touch is very important for us as human beings. When we touch someone, 
we um, actually do them a service and we do ourselves a service. I think it takes a few seconds for oxytocin to be produced within our bodies, which is known as the love hormone. It makes us feel like we belong. It's essential for a healthy mind, a healthy body, a healthy being. Cortisol, that other hormone, which is a stress hormone, which is very destructive to us, but serves our purpose when we're in a fight or flight situation, builds up in our body and needs to have a way to dissipate itself. When we have touch, for some reason, our ability to process that and get, get rid of that is much more efficient. And thirdly, dopamine, that other feel-good kind of chemical that our body produces also is connected to touch. But we are trained, and maybe you didn't have the same experience I did, but I'm sure as a child, your parent or a parental figure or teacher said, uh, don't touch it. You might have broke something when you were a kid, and walking through an antique shop or somewhere else. There are signs in certain places. You touch it, you break it, you buy it, right? Oftentimes we're afraid to put our hands out there to touch, to connect in a, in a physical way. And of course, there have been many, many examples of inappropriate touch and harmful touch. And there are many people who are victims of unwanted touch. And that alone causes us great sorrow. And yet, the gospel and this uh, good news that we get to share with the world, that Jesus brought to the world, which transforms our life, is really about God touching us and about us touching God. And there is a, a hunger for us to do so. You know that wonderful picture that's in the Sistine Chapel uh, over the top with Adam and God and that divine space in between, the, this yearning and longing for that space to disappear, for there to be that connection. Because when there is that connection, there's life, there's healing. One of the privileges I have as a pastor, and Pastor Mary Ann does too, and Pastor Larry, and all people who are blessed to, uh, to serve in this capacity and are called by the church, uh, we, we go and we pray with people. But a lot of our praying is hands-on. When I go to a hospital, I hold the person's hand when we pray. When we pray for healing, when we anoint people, we, we, we touch them with the oil on their forehead and make the sign of the cross. We lay our hands on the, the heads of babies in baptism, invoking the Holy Spirit. We lay our hands upon uh, wedding participants offering the nuptial blessing. We lay our hands on the body of those who die as we share the commendation prayers and remember the promise of baptism, redeemed through Christ. We need to touch in order to communicate the authenticity and the love and the power. There is power in touch. And we see that so clearly today in the gospel lesson these two stories embedded in one another. And you remember from last week, so I won't tell you the whole story again. The disciples just got back from being on the other side. And Jesus had this very touching moment with somebody who was possessed, set him free from his demons, plural. And now we have this encounter. We have this woman who is suffering from this hemorrhaging disease for 12 years. She spent everything she got. She is broke. She has no other options. In her desperation, she knows Jesus is there. And she says, 
to herself. I know if I just touch the hem of his garment, if I just touch his clothing, I'll be healed. And in a leap of faith, she puts out her hand at great risk. And a woman, an unclean woman, because you see her hemorrhaging most likely was uh, menstrual related, but her hemorrhaging would make her ritually unclean and she would not be permitted to be in the crowd and especially to touch another person. If she touched someone, she would make them unclean ritually as well. That's just the way it was. And she reaches out with all boldness because she had no other choice. You see, the stakes were too high not to touch, not to try. So she does it. Immediately she feels the power. Immediately Jesus feels the power leaving him, and he asks, who did this? The disciples are like, oh my goodness, what is, what is this Jesus asking me? He's asking me uh, who these people are at this time in the morning in, in this big crowd. What's going on? But Jesus keeps on searching, and the woman knew she was healed, and it says that she comes forward and she comes clean, but she falls on her knees in a posture of worship and servitude with great humility. And Jesus does not berate her while she's down there. Jesus did not say, what did you do? Look, you, you, you made me unclean. You, you did. Jesus says, daughter gives her a status which is familial, calls her his own, acknowledges what had happened, and says, peace be with you, you're healed. Can you imagine that moment? Sometimes we race through the pericope, and we, we read these readings on Sunday, and we say, oh, that was a nice story. This is everything. This woman's life is transformed. She is saved. All because she reached out boldly in faith, took a chance. Because she couldn't continue to live the way she was. Living the way she was wasn't truly living. And she knew that. Think about how many other people were part of the crowd there that were sick, that had different types of illnesses and infirmaries and and were dealing with stuff that didn't reach out and touch Jesus. Maybe they didn't believe Jesus had the power to heal. Maybe they did not believe that they were worthy. Whatever the reason or the excuse, they remained in their malady while this woman was healed. And this healing happens on the way, while Jesus is on the way going somewhere else because Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, went to Jesus to have him come and touch his daughter. He asked for Jesus' touch for his daughter. Now, he put a lot on the table by doing that. His status in the synagogue... Here, this leader is going to a rogue rabbi who has no status in society. What does this mean about his position tomorrow? What will the rest of the synagogue leader say? Will Jairus be welcomed in their midst because he went outside of the network to Jesus, who has been very, very critical of many leaders within the temple and the synagogues. But you see, the stakes were too high for Jairus. His daughter was dying. He would do anything to save her. So he falls on his knees before Jesus and begs him in a posture of humility and servitude and worship on his knees. And Jesus doesn't leave him there. He 
He says, let's go. And he goes with him. And he takes a couple of his disciples, not all of them, just a few. Peter, James, and John. Because he needs those who are full of faith, who are ready and willing to make the leap. And that's these three. And what does he encounter as he goes on his journey? He encounters a lot of skepticism. Why are you bothering the teacher? She's already gone. He encounters ridicule, Jesus. They laugh at him when Jesus says, oh, she's not dead, she's only sleeping. He puts everybody outside, just takes Jairus, his wife, and those three disciples inside. And then Jesus reaches out and touches this 12-year-old girl by the hand. It says, Talitha kum, little girl, get up. And raises her from the dead right there. And Jesus had to touch her because the stakes were so high. Because through this girl and through the woman and through Jairus and through Peter, James, and John and through this act of touching and this healing, God would be praised. And the good news that Jesus was ushering in became visible and tangible in new life in this little girl. Amazing. We can't be afraid to touch and love, to touch everyone, to touch those that society would deem untouchable. In India, there is a whole untouchable class, you know, the Dalits. For a long time, the church, especially the Lutheran church, has been working very, very hard for rights among the Dalit people. In this country, though, we don't have a class system uh, that's associated with Hinduism or anything like that. We still, though, deem people untouchable. I remember during the AIDS crisis in particular, how there was a whole section of people that literally were deemed untouchable. And all the science proved that wasn't the truth. It was fine. It didn't matter. There was an excuse and a reason to shun. We can make lists of reasons. Economic reasons, political reasons. They don't look like me, they don't talk like me, they don't speak my language. I'm not going to touch them, they're untouchable, they're out there. That's not Christian, brothers and sisters. The stakes are too high. Our motto in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America is, God's work, our hands. These hands that God gave us are to touch people in love, are to lift people up. Telethakum, little girl, get up. We are entrusted with this power, which is so incredible, the same kind of power that that woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years knew about. We have that power. The Lord has touched us and has charged us so that we can touch and lift people up, and even raise people from their dead places, dignify them, restore them as God's beloved. There was an auctioneer who was auctioning off all different things and musical instruments, and uh, he picks up uh, an old violin, and it was really not pleasant to look at at all. He holds up the violin, he goes, all right, uh, what am I going to get for this, you know, a uh, dollar? Anybody give me a dollar, two dollars, three dollars, four dollars? All of a sudden, he was up to like five or six dollars. This uh, one gentleman came forward and said, can I, can I uh, see that violin? And the auctioneer stopped and just handed it to him. 
and the man took a bow. And it was one of the greatest violinists of the day. And he takes the violin, looks at it, adjusts some of the strings, takes that bow and lays it across the strings and plays the most beautiful piece that moves everyone who is gathered there. Then the gentleman sits down. The auctioneer is moved. And he said, I'm going to continue the bidding at $1,000, $1,000. $2,000, $2,000, $3,000, $4,000, $5,000 sold. Someone said, wait a minute, what was the difference? You, you were originally selling that for a dollar, two dollars. Then it went to a thousand, two, three, four, five. He said, the difference is the master touch. We are like um, sometimes a banged up old violin, right? We have a lot of strings that are maybe not where they're supposed to be, not set, not taut, not, we're not in tune. We are marred and scratched and, and maybe not even pleasant to behold or look at. And yet, when we are in God's hands and we allow ourselves to be vulnerable and we surrender to Almighty God and we say, God, tune us for your praise, it makes all the difference. And then we make that beautiful sound that touches others and lifts them up. You know, our problem often is that we, we think too small of our God. We don't think like that woman that was suffering from hemorrhages. We don't think like Jairus, who was going on his knees before the Lord. Alexander the Great once he uh, was petitioned by a subject who came to him and said, I need money. And Alexander said, well, go talk to my treasurer and anything you need, he will give to you. So the treasurer came back to Alexander the Great and said, Alexander, uh, we have a problem. He goes, why? He goes, he asked for this tremendous amount of money. What should I do? And he said, give it to him. He said, you see, he treated me like a king in his asking. Therefore, I will treat him like a loyal subject, and I will be his king in my giving. God does not want to withhold from us any grace, any mercy, any love, any gift if we are to use it in God's service. So let us reach out. Reach out to the hem of Almighty God. Let us embrace God. Let us get on our knees. And let us surrender to this awesome, loving power. Knowing that God has a great desire to touch us and to use us so that this world can be healed. Amen. Together we confess 
our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to please be seated for the prayers. One in the communion of saints and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we join our voices in prayer. God of abundance, you will fill your church with multitudes of gifts. Sustain those among us who feel they are not valued. Open our hearts to the wondrous breath of all who come upon your name. In your mercy, hear our prayer. God of creation, your goodness abounds. Multiply the fruits of the earth and, the res and rescue it from your wastefulness. In your mercy, hear our prayer. God of justice, you rang in steadfast love. Bring peace between nations ravaged by war or strife, especially Gaza, Ukraine, Haiti, Miramar, and more than 15 war-torn eras in Africa. Illumine paths of justice and freedom for those who lead them. In your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of compassion, your touch brings healing and your word revives us for life. Hear our prayers for doctors, nurses, and healthcare workers who provide care, and for all those who are in need, especially those on our prayer list and those we name before you now, aloud or in our hearts. Patrick. Ken. Turn wailing into dancing Ken. and weeping into Ken. joy. In your mercy. Hear our, Hear our prayer. God of community, you gather us at your table of plenty. Where there is hunger among us, open your hands. Where we are indifferent to the needs of others, open our hearts. In your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of the ages, great is your faithfulness. We remember in the thanksgiving our beloved dead, who all with saints sing without ceasing in your realm of glory. In your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty God, you, through your Son, Jesus Christ, touched uh, those that society deemed untouchable with love, with power, with hope, with dignity. Help us to be so bold. Help us to invite your touch on our lives and a remolding of our ways of thinking and being. Help us to be tuned like an instrument made for your praise. We ask that those who feel as though they are lost and last and shunned, forgotten, or broken beyond repair, that your healing touch through us would reach them. Use your church and use each of us. Help us to reach out boldly in faith, trusting your mercy and power to use us and to restore others. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, holy and merciful, into your outstretched arms we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in the name of the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ, 
our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. And now, brothers and sisters, we get a chance to touch one another. You may rise if you are able. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. And don't keep the peace just to yourself. Reach out and touch somebody with the peace of Christ. Peace of the Lord be with you. Peace of the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, almighty, and merciful God. You are holy, and great is the majesty of your glory. You so loved the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish,
but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, then gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, then gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ, Christ, Christ will, will come again. again. Remembering, therefore, his salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. We ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving with your word and Holy Spirit to bless us, your servants, and these your own gifts of bread and wine, so that we and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace, and receiving forgiveness of sin may be formed to live as your holy people and be given the inheritance with all of your saints. To you, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ has set the table with more than enough for all. Come and feast.
body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Receive a benediction. The blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Go in peace. You are the body of Christ. Thanks be to God. Thank you.